Hi, my name is Teresa Bulger and I'm a consultant archaeologist working with Rubicon Heritage Services. This is the sixth in a series of talks about archaeology in the context of construction projects and development control. Our previous talks outlined, firstly, what archaeology is, why it's important and the legal framework for its protection, then how archaeology fits into the planning process, followed by an overview of archaeological methods and practice. Then an overview of how to manage archaeology as a risk item within the lifetime of a construction project and most recently how archaeological services are included within construction contracts. This final talk will focus on post excavation analysis and reporting, what it is and why it is a critical part of the archaeological works process. The on-site archaeological excavation has been completed. The site is now sterilised and ready for construction. So that's it. The job is done. No further archaeological work is needed? Well, not quite. In fact, there is still quite a lot of work that must be completed. We're now at the post excavation work stage. This is where the finds and samples that were collected during the excavation field work are analysed by specialists. Further research is carried out to place the site findings in context and a detailed final report is prepared. Depending on the scale and complexity of the on-site archaeological excavation, the post-excavation work stage can take anything from around six months to 18 months or more to complete. Most archaeologists will try and aim to complete within about 12 months though. Costs for post-excavation can vary considerably. Again, a lot depends on the character and scale of the site that was excavated. But these would be expected to be of an order of between maybe 30 and 35% of the on-site works and around 80%. Rural greenfield sites tend towards the bottom end of that range, while urban excavations tend towards the upper end. But this is not a hard and fast rule. For example, a cemetery site, which could as easily be rural, will tend towards the upper end of the range due to the requirements for analysis of the excavated human remains. In our last talk, we noted that in public sector contracts at the end of stage three, the on-site excavation stage, a post-excavation assessment must be prepared. This sets out the scope of works required at post-excavation stage or stage four for the relevant site. Though this is usually only a contractual requirement in the public sector, it is best practice to prepare such an assessment or scope statement for all excavation projects at the end of the on-site works phase. But why is post-excavation analysis and reporting actually necessary? There are legal reasons. First of all, we have compliance with the excavation license, which includes a number of binding conditions. Artifacts and ecofacts recovered during the excavation must be deposited with the National Museum. So in accordance with the museum's standards for this, they must be processed, catalogued, analysed by appropriate experts, so that they are in a condition for accessioning to the museum. A full and final report must be submitted to the National Monument Service and the National Museum. In order to do this, all of the records from the on-site works need to be collated, drawings and plans of the findings prepared, Results of the analysis of artefacts and ecofacts must be integrated. The report must be a comprehensive account of the findings. Then, obviously, there is compliance with the conditions of planning. Archaeological excavations generally occur on development sites as a direct consequence of planning conditions. These require that the archaeological excavation is completed to the required legal standard, that is, in accordance with the conditions of the licence issued. This can only be fully demonstrated by submission of the final excavation report to the relevant planning authority as part of the planning compliance documentation for the development. Many planning conditions will state this very explicitly. They may also be explicit about the deposition of artefacts and ecofacts to the National Museum and the deposition of the excavation archive with the National Monument Service or with Dublin City Council Excavation Archive. There are also ethical reasons. Analysis is needed to fully understand what was found during the excavation. Reporting creates an accessible documentary account of the findings that can be shared and utilised by others. If we do not do this, then the excavation is effectively incomplete. 
and it diminishes the value of the investment of time and resources in the on-site excavation works. The point of carrying out an archaeological excavation, particularly to facilitate development, is to create a gain in our knowledge and understanding of our past to offset the loss to future generations from the destruction of the affected site. The post-excavation process turns the raw data that we create during on-site archaeological excavation into a coherent body of knowledge about that specific site that can be incorporated into our existing, more general bodies of knowledge about our past. It can then be further enhanced by any new discoveries and information that may occur in the future. In designing and delivering a scope of works for post-excavation analysis, this principle of a return of knowledge should be a guiding factor. But what exactly does post-excavation analysis entail? During an archaeological excavation, standardised records, scale drawings, surveys and photographs are taken to create a record of the site. These must be digitised, analysed and collated so that we have a full integrated record and can develop a narrative account of the excavation. This will be the core of the final report. During archaeological excavation, artefacts and samples, sometimes referred to as ecofacts, are retained. All artefacts must undergo basic cleaning, sorting and cataloguing so that they can be quantified and are ready to be sent out to specialists. Some artefacts may require conservation, particularly metal finds or finds made from organic materials such as leather. This ensures that they are clean and stable and will not deteriorate in the long term. All artefacts are examined by suitable specialists. This will identify exactly what each object is and how it might have been used. This can give us information about the types of activity that may have occurred at the site and the economic status of its inhabitants. Artefacts can point to trading links and external contacts. Certain artefacts, notably coins and tokens, can be closely dated, which can assist in developing a chronology for the excavated site. Human remains are considered an archaeological object. Once they have been cleaned, they are then analysed by a qualified osteologist. From this, we can develop a demographic picture of the population looking at age profiles, health and well-being and other issues. Newer analysis techniques such as ancient DNA and isotope analysis can further enhance the findings from these core osteological studies. Samples retained from excavations can include soil samples, industrial waste or metallurgical slags, animal bone and wood or timber. These also require processing and cataloguing before they are sent out to specialists. Analysis of industrial waste can tell us about the type and range of industrial activities carried out at a site. This can include different types of metalworking, glassworking and other high temperature processes. Analysis of animal bone provides information about diet and economy, what the inhabitants of the site were eating and the types of livestock they maintained. Processed soil samples can produce macrofossil plant remains and charcoal. These can tell us about the ancient environment of a site, as well as providing information on crops that were grown in Eden. Analysis of wood samples can provide information on the ancient environment, as well as woodland management and woodworking practices. Scientific dating, mainly in radiocarbon dating or dendrochronological dating, can be carried out on selected samples of material to develop a chronology for the site. All of this diverse information must then be pulled together into the final report to present an integrated picture of the site that was excavated. Once this report is completed, the artefacts and ecofacts must then be correctly boxed up for long-term storage and arrangements made to deposit them with the National Museum. The rest of the archive, the site records, photographs, surveys and drawings, are then packed properly for deposition with either the National Monument Service Archive or the Dublin City Archaeological Archive. One final step that is usually a contractual requirement in public sector contracts is dissemination. This is the sharing of the results, making them available to the public. 
A variety of approaches can be taken in isolation and combination, from press releases, blog or social media posts, to formal publications such as journal articles and books. There are also a number of online archiving options that can provide access to summaries and full reports of archaeological excavations carried out in Ireland, such as the Excavations Bulletin Database, the Dublin County Archaeological Project and the TII Digital Heritage Collection. Dissemination is an opportunity for developers. Through promoting the sharing of new knowledge generated by an archaeological excavation, a developer can demonstrate a positive side effect of their project. They can demonstrate also an ethical approach to development that takes account of heritage protection and promotion. So in this talk, we've given an overview of post-excavation analysis and reporting and why it is a critical part of the archaeological works process. If you want to find out more about this topic, there is a list of links to further resources in our blog post for this talk. Our previous five talks, firstly outlining what archaeology is, why it's considered important and the legislation protecting it, secondly looking at archaeology in the planning process, thirdly giving an overview of archaeological methods and practice, fourthly giving an overview of how best to manage archaeology as a risk item in construction projects, and fifthly looking at how archaeological services are included in construction contracts are all available for you to watch online. This is the final talk in this series. Please check our website and social media channels for updates on future events and activities. Thank you.